city parks to wildlands and roadsides. Uh, we also have a certification program for farmers and businesses that are looking to support pollinators. And we have the B City and B Campus USA programs that support communities that are providing healthy habitat and protection from pesticides. So if you're interested in learning more about any of these things, uh, you can visit our website, which is at xerces.org, xerces.org. And one of the things that we, we spend a lot of our time on is writing up all kinds of guidance, um, science-based guidance for protecting pollinators and other invertebrates. So lots of national and regional resources on plants and pollinators, pesticides, whatever you wanna know about um, these little insects, hopefully we have something that will be helpful. So this is, this is decades of work that have gone into this resource library. So where do I start? So when I say we uh, conserve invertebrates or if we're working to um, conserve pollinators, so in, invertebrates are animals that, that lack a backbone. That's many classes of animals from insects to crustaceans. Um, invertebrates account for over 95% of animal biodiversity on the planet. And they play really crucial roles from breaking down organic matter, keeping pest populations in check, serving as food, the, they're the base of the food chain and pollinating crops and wildflowers. Um, so sustaining the abundance and diversity and biomass of these little things that run the world is essential for healthy ecosystems. And really what I th think the most about is pollination and pollinators. This is a really important ecosystem function um, as more than 85% of flowering plants require an animal. And among those, it's mostly insects to move pollen from flower to flower to produce seeds and nuts and fruits. Um, and so a diverse pollinator community is essential for sustaining both natural areas as well as productive agricultural lands and our own home gardens. Pollinators are incredibly important for these natural systems. They let these wild flowering plants reproduce and continue to reseed in their environments. And the seeds and fruits that those flowering plants Produced are also food sources for many other types of wildlife from birds to mammals. The pollinators are also part of the base of that food chain themselves. So about nine in 10 bird species eat insects at some point in their lives. And caterpillars in particular are incredibly important food source for many birds, um, especially when they're feeding their young. The pound for pound, these insects contain more than twice as much protein as beef. So they're just an incredible protein source for birds. They're also important for our diets. So this is probably if you've seen our presentations before, you've seen this photo. This is from a small project that Xerces did with Whole Foods. And this is what a typical produce section looks like with all different kinds of pollinated foods. And then what it would look like without pollinators and without the foods that they pollinate. So over half the items in this produce section were removed from the shelves. Um, it would be pretty sad to go into a produce section without pollinated foods. And pollinators are needed for very important parts of my diet, which are coffee and chocolate. Um, and just a, a really fun fact about chocolate, you might already know this, but um, chocolate is actually pollinated by a fly. So many, many things are pollinated by bees, but chocolate, uh, this is the cocoa flower, which is this really intricate flower with nectaries that are hard to access for big insects. So perfectly sized for this tiny little midge that uh, pollinates chocolate. So very important insect in my life. Um, and just in, in sort of reviewing who the pollinators are, there's lots of things that visit flowers, usually for nectar, and end up moving pollen around from flower to flower. So lots of invertebrates, butterflies, flies, beetles, and also a few vertebrates like hummingbirds and bats, although we don't really have flower visiting bats up here in the Northeast. But in terms of the VIPs, the very important pollinators, it's bees. Um, and we have an incredible diversity of native bees, uh, many of which we will find in our own gardens. 
There are over 350 species of native bees in Connecticut and more than 10 times that across the whole country that range in size from a tiny little freckle sized bee to a large carpenter bee that might be in your shed. So these bees are going around actively collecting pollen for their young and moving it from flower to flower and supporting our wild and our, uh, our garden ecosystems. Um, and just to mention, and again, this is something you'll see if you've seen one of my presentations before, I did wanna quickly talk about honeybees. They're probably the first bee that comes to mind. They're usually the first bee that you're gonna see in the spring to, um, as they overwinter as a perennial colony. Um, they're very unusual among bees. This is a species that was brought to America by ship with European colonists, and it's pretty unique. It's managed for its honey, um, and it's managed for pollination. So it's a, it's a social species with a queen that's releasing pheromones and uh, controlling sort of the, the behavior of the rest of this colony. Um, and it has usually multiple generations a year of offspring coming from that queen. Uh, hopefully uh, it would be a perennial colony. That's not always been the case in the past decade or two. Um, you know, there's been a lot of overwintering kills of, of honeybee colonies, but typically a honeybee colony would survive about three to four years. The queen in that colony would survive about three to four years before being replaced. Um, Anyway, this is, this is unusual among bee species in, in how it lives and how it's managed. The rest of them uh, are much more unmanaged and most of them are quite different from honeybees. The vast majority are living underground with only tiny little holes in the surface. Maybe they look like ant nests that give any sign that they're there. And the other third are living above ground in tunnels, in old pithy plant stems and snags of um, you know, dead standing wood. So on the right here is a, a serotina, which is a small carpenter bee that's got a hole in the side of a blueberry cane and has its nest inside of that cane. Um, among native bee species, the ones that are closest to honeybees are bumblebees, which form small colonies that live um, in a variety of different environments, but often are looking for things like rodent holes where they can get into an existing burrow underground and use the, the old sort of rodent um, fur to kind of warm their nest, or they'll go under a bunch grass and use that old grass to insulate their nest. So they're, they're looking for these kind of cavities that they can insulate and, and form a small colony in. So why do we have to protect them and why do we need to talk about how to do so? There's many um, threats to pollinators and other flying insects. And while we don't always have the monitoring data to say this species is in decline or that species is in decline, there's a good amount of evidence suggesting that on the whole, we're seeing declines in abundance of our pollinating species due to a lot of the same stress factors that threaten other kinds of wildlife. Some of these fall into sort of major buckets um, that, that are true for a lot of different kinds of wildlife. So habitat loss or the loss of food and shelter, pesticide use, um, so lots of uh, potential for exposure in both agricultural and urban spaces to pesticides, um, diseases and competition from non-native species, and then climate change, which is probably going to have a variety of unpredictable impacts on these um, communities of, of insects. But the good news is there are steps that we can take to address all of these threats. And many of them are things that we can contribute to even in a small space. So in terms of habitat, we can conserve and create habitat for pollinators, lots of flowering resources for them, um, undisturbed nesting environments. We can reduce reliance on pesticides and we can work to uh, keep bees protected where there is habitat for them from pesticides. We can work to reduce risks from managed and invasive species um, and make sure that bees have a healthy environment to live in. And then 
as we're doing all of this in terms of creating habitat, we can plan for species diversity and habitat diversity, which builds resilience into the system when you have erratic weather um, or you know, an early warm up in the spring or what have you. The more plant diversity that we plan for and design into our landscapes, um, the more likely that it's gonna be able to survive through some of those uh, impacts of climate change. So just in, in sort of review for anyone who's thought about pollinators and how to protect them in their yards, um, let's just talk quickly about what pollinators really need and how we can build that into our gardens and our landscapes. So what they need is food, shelter, and protection from pesticides. Um, so for bees, that's, that's flowering plants that provide nectar and pollen. Um, for butterflies and uh, moths, that would be larval host plants, as well as uh, sources of nectar as adults. Uh, they need shelter for nesting and overwintering. So for, for bees, again, that's sort of an undisturbed space where they can burrow into the ground or providing them with those pithy plants for the above ground nesting bees um, that love to go into these, these old plant stems. And I'll talk more about managing those plant stems later in the presentation. And then overwintering, sort of undisturbed, leaving the leaves, overwintering habitat for um, a variety of different beneficial insects as well. And then over again, refuge from pesticides. So once we have this habitat that's attracted in our pollinators, that's attracted in our natural enemies and other beneficial insects, we need to protect that space from pesticides. So Xerxes has a variety of different guides, and this is one that you might not be for, familiar with. Um, it's relatively new, and it's, it's basically a habitat assessment guide that helps evaluate your site, and this is one that's meant for urban spaces, um, that sort of walks you through how to assess the existing pollinator potential um, as you're kind of designing a space for pollinators or thinking about how you could improve a space for pollinators. Um, it walks through some of the foraging needs, you know, what's the percent of site that has flowering vegetation and what, what's flowering at different times of the year. So just kind of a, providing a checklist for you to think about as you're trying to identify what, what gaps there might be to, to fill in or improve a space for pollinators. Um, so this is available on our website. Um, we also have similar guides for natural areas and for farms, but this was one that's meant for urban spaces and it's, it's relatively new and kind of helpful. So I thought I would mention that. So just at the, at the base of that, one of the things that that guide, the assessment guide would help point out is sort of uh, the deficiencies in bloom time. Because one, one of the things we really wanna do when we're conserving the biodiversity of pollinators in our yard is make sure we have something flowering at every time through the season. Um, different bees are gonna come out at different times of year. Some bees are present all the way through the growing season, like bumblebees, some of our sweat bees um, that have multiple generations through the year. And then there are other bees that really only come out for a few weeks during the summer uh, or the spring and just need something that's flowering and, and blooming at that time of year. So the more that we have in bloom at any given time through the season, the more things we're gonna be able to support and make sure that they're not entering a starvation phase at any point during the summer. Um, so these are just a few examples of, of different ways you can incorporate beautiful native plants um, at different times of the season. Uh, and for, for bumblebees in particular that have, uh, they, you know, the, the queens overwinter and come out in the spring, that early season resource when she first comes out. So right now, I know I have maples flowering in my yard um, that are covered in bees. Some of those early season woody plants can be really important resources. Um, this is a vulnerable time when the weather is shifting. Sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's warm. Having things, uh, a lot of things blooming in early spring is really important. And then again in late fall, um, when the, the new queens that have been produced by bumblebee colonies are building up their stores for the winter, um, that's, that's another really critical time for bumblebees in particular, is that late fall period where 
the queens are fattening up and ready to go hibernate for the winter. Thinking about biodiversity conservation again, um, one of the tricks is to just select species from different plant families. So we're trying to get both generalists and specialists to the table. So inviting more, more pollinators in and including species from a range of different plant families, it generally benefits a greater uh, diversity of wildlife um, and builds soil health too. So different plant families often have different flower shapes, they have different bloom times, they have different pollen quality, nutritional value. So um, there are a lot of different bees that are pollen specialists. Um, some of these, these plants are uh, on this slide because they support a specialist bee, something that, um, you know, specialists, there's sort of a spectrum of pollen specialization, but uh, what that really means typically is that a bee will forage on a, one kind of plant, whether it's a single species or a genera, um, a genus of, of plants, um, or a family of plants. So there's a lot of bees that are specialists on asters, um, the specialists on sunflowers, um, and then there's, there's others that are, that are even more specialized just on a single species of plant, but that's, that's the only thing that they are feeding their young. So if you wanna learn more about pollen specialist bees, um, there's a great list of specialist bees of the, the Eastern United States and the plants that they forage on at jaredfowler.com. Um, you can just search that specialist bees of the Eastern United States and it should come up. Um, but that's a great tool and resource to look at if you're trying to provide pollen for some of these um, specialized bees and per, you know, provide for greater biodiversity. The other thing for plant selection is to think about larval host plants for butterflies. Um, so the obvious one that comes to mind is for the monarch caterpillars. Um, they, they need native milkweeds. And the monarch is, has been incredibly threatened by a variety of factors, including deforestation and their overwintering sites, but also just the loss of these host plants across their breeding range up through the Midwest and into the Northeast. Um, these milkweeds are also a really high quality nectar source for other beneficial insects. You, you know, if you put a milkweed in your yard, you'll see so many insects come and visit it. Um, but, but the monarch butterfly is not the only butterfly that needs a different host plant. Um, I would encourage you, if you haven't found this resource already, to look at wildflower.org, which is the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center down in the, uh, in the Texas area. But they have lists of monarch host, sorry, butterfly host plants for the entire United States. So if you're looking to support a specific kind of butterfly that you'd like to see in your yard, um, you can go to wildflower.org and it will tell you what the host plan is for that kind of butterfly and have provide some other um, good resources around native plants and native plant selection for your area. So just a few slides here. I wanted to talk a little bit about nursery um, nursery plant selection. So this is a, a group I'm sure that understands the value of native plants in particular in supporting native insects. So lots of things have evolved over time um, together. So, you know, wild bees are, are going out and generally choosing to collect mainly pollen from native plants. Um, there are a, a variety of cultivars and ornamental varieties that um, can provide nectar, can provide some pollen, but a lot of ornamental varieties um, can lack value for as habitat for, for native insects, um, in particular those that are sh really showy. So double petal varieties have taken the anthers that have the pollen on them and replaced them with more petals. Um, so those, those often don't have accessible nectar or pollen. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, and we've, we've just developed new resources around this, is to make sure that when you're purchasing plants from a nursery, um, that you're really making sure those plants have not been treated with insecticides that are, you're then gonna be bringing back 
to your, your yard, putting them in the garden, and then exposing pollinators to those, those systemic insecticides that are still present in the plant when you bring it back and transplant it into your yard. Um, so if you're, if you're interested in this, and I'm, I'm sorry, this is a little bit fuzzy here. Um, I think I grabbed the wrong image from the website of our new resources, but this is, these are two new fact sheets that we just released last month on buying bee safe plants and then also offering bee safe plants. So just one is the sort of consumer side. When you go to a nursery, what do you ask about to figure out whether that nursery is growing plants in a way that uh, is gonna be safe for pollinators when you, when you purchase those plants and put them in your yard. And then on the other side of it, uh, if you're a nursery, how can you talk to your producer if you're purchasing plants um, to figure out what sort of pest management practices they're using to make sure that you're offering these safe plants to the consumers that wanna buy them. So this is um, on our website now, we have both of these resources. And I did also wanna mention if you're interested in this, you know, you're talking to your local nursery, we have a, a new campaign around buying bee safe plants and talking to your nursery about uh, pest management that's friendly to pollinators. And so I would definitely recommend going on our website and checking it out. We have a day of action coming up on Earth Week, uh, April 22nd. We're just encouraging folks, you know, as you're doing your sort of spring planting, thinking about purchasing plants or seeds from a nursery um, to incorporate talking with them about pest management for pollinators as part of that visit to your, to your nursery in the spring. Um, and I can, I can answer more questions about that at the end if you want to know more, but it's basically wanting to start the conversation to, to let nurseries know that there's a lot of demand for pollinator friendly production, knowing that you know, those kinds of requests and conversations coming from buyers can really change practices. Okay, so last couple of slides here just about garden management for pollinators. Um, so going back to the three things that bees need, they need food, they need shelter. So this is the shelter part, uh, nesting and overwintering sites. So for bees and wasps, nesting sites, um, you know, an undisturbed space that isn't mulched over, that isn't landscape fabriced over, um, where they can get into the ground. And then for butterflies and moths, some pupation and overwintering sites. And that often looks like just leaving the leaves, staying a little messy through the winter. Um, so if you, you know, if you have a grassy area, maybe you rake some of those leaves into the areas that um, don't have the grass if you're trying to protect, you know, your patch of grass in your yard. But um, avoiding, avoiding the sort of flailing and shredding leaves and bagging them up and taking them off, um, because these are areas where our beneficial insects overwinter. So they, they could really use that kind of undisturbed overwintering time and will then emerge out of the leaves the next year. This is also a good practice in terms of sort of building soil and providing organic matter and, and nutrients, um, making sure that you're not just carting those off the yard every year. One of the questions I often get is about uh, how to manage stems for the pithy or the sort of pithy and hollow stemmed plants that provide some, some above ground nesting habitat. How do I manage those for pollinators? Um, and I mean, the, the sort of longer answer, I guess the, the short answer is you may not have to manage them at all if you really wanna protect pollinators that are living in those stems. But if you're wanting to you know, keep your yard looking relatively neat what you can do is kind of an uh, intermediate, which is to leave flower stems intact over the winter and then prune them back once temperatures are consistently over 50 or 60 degrees in the daytime, prune the, the stems back to create openings at the tops of the stems that would be new nest sites for bees that are emerging that spring. Um, so you can cut them back at a variety of different heights leaving you know, that pithy part exposed at the top so that um, 
a bee might, you know, come over to your, your newly chopped monarda, your bee balm stem, and form a little nest um, that coming spring. So if you're wanting to neaten up, I would say wait until the spring to do so when temperatures are, are consistently above 50 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit during the daytime. Um, and pay attention. This is one of the biggest things you can do to learn how to better conserve pollinators in your yard. See what they're using um, and when they're using it. And that can kind of help uh, show you when to manage it. So that's, that's kind of the review section of the building a foundation of food and shelter for pollinators in your home yard or garden. Um, but the third piece that I'm gonna talk about for most of the rest of this presentation is the protection from pesticides and the thinking about how you can manage pests while protecting pollinators and providing them with refuge. So I, I, we, I talked at the very beginning about the little things that run the world and how many important ecosystem functions they provide. And the vast majority of insects are directly beneficial to humans or otherwise foundational in ecosystems. And less than 2% of insects are what we might consider pests. Uh, even those can be beneficial. So things that we think of as pests are actually often the food source for other insects at some low level of those um, pest insects can support natural enemies, other beneficials. But many of the chemicals we use for insect disease and weed management can be harmful for more than just their target species, as Rachel Carson pointed out in Silent Spring. So some of these things, if we think you know, beyond insects, it's helpful to consider more deeply even what we think of as a pest what do we consider to be a pest? Things that compete with people for resources. Um, this might be things that carry diseases like mosquitoes and ticks. And then there's nuisance organisms or just things that we don't like, but they don't actually cause real harm or damage. So things like ants in the picnic shelter or dandelions in the yard. So pests and what we consider to be pests are really a spectrum some of those things might need some kind of intervention or management and others might not. So in order to pr protect pollinators from pesticides and to be providing them with that refuge, it's important to think about how they can be exposed. So there's lots of different um, exposure pathways that just depend on the chemical and how it's applied. Um, they can include the most obvious one would be direct contact. You have a bee out on a flower and you're taking a bottle and spraying that flower. That would probably um, not be happening in your gardens, but um, the type of bee and its behavior. So if it's in the soil or nesting above ground, those are important pieces to think about when you're understanding possible exposure routes. So our native bees are different from the honeybee. They don't build a hive. Um, some bees are collecting pieces of leaves from their nests and, so, and other bees are in the soil. So if the leaves or the soil are also contaminated, that could represent an exposure route. And that's something to think about in urban landscapes where a lot of yards are receiving systemic insecticide treatments. So systemic insecticides are those that are water soluble and so can be taken up by plants. Um, so a lot of the yard treatments that you'll see for grub control are systemic insecticides. And so they'll percolate into the soil and then they can move into other areas of the yard and be taken up by other plants or simply contaminate the soil where bees might be nesting. So there are, you know, there's language on labels that often tries to reduce exposure to bees and, um, uh, other non-target organisms, but they don't account for all of these different pieces of bees life cycles and how chemicals might move after they're applied. So we need to be thinking sort of holistically about um, how, how bees and other insects might be exposed um, or really any species of concern and how those label directions may or may not be that protective. 
When we think about pesticides, we often picture a tractor in an agricultural area, but pesticides are commonly used in urban landscapes as well, often for cosmetic reasons. Um, and actually more pesticides are used per acre in urban areas than in many agricultural areas. Uh, a lot of rivers in urban areas, 90% of rivers in urban areas have been found to contain pesticides at levels that are risky to aquatic life. Um, these are pesticides washing off from grasses, grass and patios and impervious surfaces into our, our waterways. One thing I did want to mention specifically, because I know a lot of home gardeners do use organic pesticides, and I did want to mention that organic doesn't necessarily mean risk-free for pollinators. Um, so some organic insecticides can be as highly toxic on contact as conventional insecticides to bees. Um, these are things like pyrethrins or spinosad. These are some of the, the big ones that are used in uh, gardening and farming. And then some others have other concerns. So Bt uh, is an example of an organic pesticide that's used um, for caterpillars. So Bt is one, an example of something that isn't, so there's different strains. It's basically a stomach bacterium, uh, a soil bacterium that produces these proteins that poke holes in insect stomachs and different strains of Bt are specific to different groups of insects. So the most common organic Bt spray is a strain that targets caterpillars. Um, so that's butterflies and moths. So it's, it's practically non-toxic to bees, but it's not uh, a safe pesticide for butterflies and moths. Uh, neem oil is an insect growth regulator, which means that it affects juvenile insects, uh, larval insects. So it's not non-toxic if it comes into contact with um, the larval, like a larval bee, for example, or a larval butterfly. Um, thus, I'm saying a lot here, but this doesn't actually mean um, that organic pest management is any way on par with conventional pest management. Um, most organic pesticides are less stable than their synthetic counterparts, and they break down more quickly when they're exposed to light and air. So one example uh, that you may or may not be familiar with is pyrethrins and pyrethroids. Pyrethrins, which are toxic on contact, but highly unstable and break down quickly. Um, they are a common organic insecticide that's derived from the chrysanthemum flower. Pyrethroids are its synthetic relatives. Um, so the pyrethroids were developed basically to be much more stable and persistent in the environment. Um, you might have a mosquito company come and tell you that pyrethroids are derived from the chrysanthemum flower, which sounds very nice, but they're actually very much not equivalent um, as pyrethroids will last days to weeks longer in the environment than pyrethrins, the organic version. So something to keep in mind, uh, if you want to know more about organic pesticides, we have guidance on our website that goes through what we know about the toxicity of lots of different organic pesticides to pollinators and beneficial insects. We lack data on a lot of these things, but what we do know is in this guidance document. And then finally, um, in terms of the toxicity of pesticides, um, when we steer you away from pesticide products, that's not to say that you should concoct your own remedies. Just because an ingredient is familiar, it doesn't make it safe, especially when it's in mixtures and especially when it's being applied um, you know, at, at rates that are probably a lot higher than you might think um, would be toxic to, to other beneficial insects. So dish soap is an, is an example of something that can affect pretty much anything it comes into contact with using a dish soap spray on your plants. Um, while it is something that can um, easily kill a, uh, a pest that's on those plants, it will also break down the plant's natural defense mechanisms by stripping away some of the oils and waxes on its leaves. So it can kind of weaken the plant at the same time as killing the pest that's on it. Um, and that might make it more vulnerable to more pests down the road. 
So this, this on the screen, if you can read it, um, this was from a gardening group that I um, saw on Facebook. There was a post about um, all kinds of different remedies used in, in this person's garden. Um, and they even tried using, uh, uh, creating their own fungicide with a fungus cream meant for their feet. Highly do not recommend doing that. <laughs> There's different, different fungi have different things that affect them. Please do not apply foot fungus cream to your plants. Okay, so let us walk through some of the um, insecticide risks around your home garden that might be less obvious than the ones where you're just directly applying something to a plant. So maybe for example, you have a tree that was struggling. So you called an arborist or tree doctor and that person might inject or otherwise treat the tree with a fungicide or an insecticide. Um, these are again, systemic treatments. So they are water soluble. They're taken up by that plant. They can be often very persistent. Um, neonicotinoids are an example of a class of systemic insecticides and they are very persistent once they're in a woody plant. Um, so things like basil bark applications, soil drenches, trunk injections, the chemicals are taken up by the plant and can still be there the year later, a year later after application. Um, so a recent study by a pesticide manufacturer found that blossoms and leaves could be contaminated with B toxic levels of neonics the following year. Um, there's newer systemic pesticides that are less well studied and perhaps are less persistent. We're not sure, but um, this is just something to be aware of, especially if you're trying to treat a tree that is really attractive to pollinators. Just knowing sort of, depending on what you're, what you're applying for, it might not be worth it if it's gonna be present in that pollen and nectar the following year. Um, there are also, uh, we, we recently surveyed milkweed from a number of different sites in both ag and urban spaces. Um, and that included some backyard gardens and at one home where pesticides hadn't been applied in six years, the milkweed was contaminated with concerning levels of an insecticide that's commonly used to manage structural pests. Um, so we found out that right before the current owner moved in six years ago, the home had been treated for ants and termites. Um, and so the milkweed was contaminated from this structural application six years prior. So this is something to be aware of when you're putting plants around your house, like sort of around the foundation in particular, that if you have put in perimeter or foundation insecticide treatments for termites or carpenter ants, some of those can be really persistent and toxic to pollinators. Um, so just something to, to think about, and you might want to, if you are I think, considering a perimeter or foundation treatment, um, moving to less pollinator attractive plants in the area around the foundation. Um, so if that is um, if that is a concern, you don't want to be attracting pollinators into a plant that is is heavily contaminated. So let's move a little bit into away from the risks part and into how do you reduce reliance on or use of pesticides in a home garden environment so you can avoid the need for use of chemicals in this environment um, and provide a healthy place for pollinators to live. So this is sort of shifting gears a little bit into how can I use prevention and preventive practices to build a good foundation for pollinators and minimize the number of pests that I'm having to deal with in my yard. So building a resilient ecosystem starts with choosing the right plant for the right place based on the local conditions, building and improving your soils so you have really healthy soils, uh, increasing plant and beneficial insect diversity, and the two of those things really go hand in hand. So as you put more types of plants into your yard, you're going to get more types of insects and uh, often get a really good base of natural enemies and other great things that are going to come in and help provide pest control, keep things from breaking, from getting into outbreak stage. 
And then not crowding your plants. So making sure they're spaced out so they get good sunlight and good airflow. Some of the, so I'm gonna also talk through what happens when the foundation um, that you've, you know, you've built doesn't work and something breaks, breaks out. You have an outbreak of a pest. Um, I'll talk about that in the process of, for decision-making that we use when that happens um, in just a little bit. So in terms of this preventive management and building resilience and a good foundation uh, in your home garden, what that would look like would be things like choosing to plant resistant varieties. So let's say you know that you have um, a certain kind of disease that typically crops up in, in one of your, um, your garden plants. Seek out and try to find another kind of plant that's more resistant to that um, disease. So finding a tomato variety that is uh, more resistant to the, the type of fungus that you tend to get, you know, a blight for example, that you tend to get in your garden. Building in and planning out rotations of your garden vegetables so that you're not um, you know, putting in plants that are gonna be susceptible to that same disease into that soil again. Um, you know, tomatoes are a great example of something that is susceptible to lots of different kinds of pathogens, late blight, early blight, septoria leaf spot. If there has been an issue like that in your garden, um, you know, you're wanting to, to plant those resistant varieties and then rotate them out into another area of the garden to break the cycle of that disease. Um, a good source of information on resistant varieties in particular, at least here on the East Coast is Cornell University, that they have a good list of, of resistant varieties to look for. Um, prevention is also about building the soil, making sure you have good drainage, adding organic matter to very sandy or heavy clay soils, checking nutrient levels and pH. Um, and you can take a soil sample and send it off to a variety of soil labs for testing. And it can be really worth it. You can learn a lot from a good soil test. Um, UMass Amherst is a pretty inexpensive option for home garden soil tests. And then finally, one thing that we often get wrong is watering. So you do wanna water wisely not too much and not too little. The best options for our gardens are often soaker hoses or drip ir irrigation. So not those overhead sprinklers that go back and forth, which tend to water just sort of the very top part of the topsoil. Um, and they promote shallow root growth as opposed to the sort of soaking mechanism or drip that promotes roots to grow down into the soil. Um, that's going to help your plants better withstand heat and drought stress later in the season um, than the overhead sprinkler and the shallow rooting would. So best way to do that is to just turn, turn your soaker hose, your drip on, go do something else, and then come back when the water has, has really soaked in deeply. So you've planted appropriate varieties and species, you're building healthy soils, you're watering wisely, the next step of active prevention is um, physical barriers, mulches. So in a vegetable garden, this means things like a floating row cover that could be used to exclude certain pests from susceptible crops. So like flea beetles from brassicas and various other greens, um, cabbage loopers, early season cucumber beetles from your melons and squash and cucumbers. Um, they can also be good for keeping other garden nibblers out of your garden, so squirrels and deer. Uh, they can also be repurposed for extending the season for warm season crops. Organic mulches are another simple addition just for kind of weed control and moisture retention purposes. Um, one practice I do recommend in general though is leaving, making sure in somewhere in your space you have some unmulched areas around the back or around the sides that are undisturbed, providing some bare soil for bees to nest in. Uh, in terms of composting, many of you may compost yard waste and other materials, which you then put back into your garden beds. If you're composting, you just wanna make sure that you're doing a thorough job and that your compost is reaching high enough temperatures to actually kill off pathogens from any plant materials you're putting in there. 
Um, this usually can't be accomplished by just kind of throwing stuff in a pile and hoping it works. You do have to do some active management of your compost, um, turning and recharging the piles with carbon, nitrogen, and water and air to make sure it actually reaches those higher temperatures. Um, there's lots of good resources out there on composting and some great YouTube videos, but um, I did want to mention that because that often can be a source of you know, seeds and pathogens coming back into the garden and becoming a problem again. Other preventive management steps, including pruning in the spring to improve airflow in your trees and shrubs. A lot of times those trees and shrubs like pruning more than you would realize and they can really respond well to it. Um, and then another, which is can be trickier, is um, using track crops to attract and, and manage insects that might otherwise become pests. So uh, for example, planting a row of lovage on either side of your tomatoes to attract tomato hornworms before they get into your actual tomatoes. Um, every crop attracts a different specific set of pests. So trap crops aren't like a one size fits all solution, uh, but they can, you know, border plantings and intercrops and container gardens can be used as kind of trap crops to draw pests away from the, uh, the, the crops that you don't want them to be feeding on. It's a fun kind of experiment to play around with and see what works. Okay, so let's talk about some of the process that we use for figuring out um, what to do about pests when they do come up in your, your home yard or garden. So if you're seeing insects, plant damage, other symptoms. Um, sometimes it's, it's just the damage that you're seeing and you don't see insects on the plant. What you wanna do is really look closely at and around the plant. Are you seeing evidence of insects having been there at some point, like insect frass, insect poop, um, some kind of fine webbing, or maybe there's mining trails in the leaves like this? Um, what kind of symptoms are you seeing on leaves and flowers? Is it holes? Is it skeletonizing of tissue? Is it dieback of stems and branches? Um, what are you seeing on your leaves in terms of browning and leaf curling and all of those things? So one of these things, one of the things that's really helpful these days is having a smartphone uh, or something that can take photos um, and you know you can upload them onto your computer. If you can take some good photos of the damage or the insects that you're seeing, you can help experts identify the specific issues. Um, also keep some notes on sort of the timing of when the problem developed and what kind of things you're seeing, how many insects are present or sort of the extent of damage. All of those different observations are gonna be helpful to both identify the problem and then choose how to figure out what you're gonna do about it. So, one of the, I just wanted to use an example from my own garden. Um, and the process here is the same one I think that you could use. The, the choice that I make might be different than the one that you do. So uh, this, is, this is one of the plants that I had in my home garden in Connecticut, uh, which is purple coneflower, Echinacea purpurea. Um, I, it has these beautiful flower heads that attract all kinds of bees and butterflies. This is a, a common, no, this is, sorry, a brown belted bumblebee on it in the yard. I also had a ton of sweat bees and uh, skippers and butterflies that visited. And then this on the right is what it looked like later in the season. There were, you know, this kind of webbing and frass and damage and everything looked a little bit haggard. Um, I wondered what the heck was going on and what to do about it. So, the first thing I had to do was figure out what I was dealing with before I could make any decisions about it. So looking closely at the flowers, I could see that there was dark webbing and frass that was kind of embedded between those orange bracts of the flower, which indicated it was probably gonna, it was probably an insect pest. And I couldn't see it at first, but then I pulled a few flower heads apart and spotted this brown and, and tan striped caterpillar at work. Um, and you know, to manage these pests and diseases, you have to know the life cycle and the habitat needs of what you're dealing with before you make any decisions. 
just because something is eating your plants doesn't mean it's actually necessarily harmful in the long term or the short term. So not everybody is an entomologist or knows an entomologist, but if you come across something like this and you're like, I don't know what this caterpillar is, there are lots of resources that can help with identifying insects and also plant diseases. So sometimes a quick internet search can be a good starting point um, with the sort of description of the insect, the plant it's on, and the type of damage. But it can be, you, you do wanna be cautious about over interpreting based on your first search results. So if you want more personalized information, um, there's online resources of experts. So your local university extension, Master Gardener Hotline, Plant Diagnostic Laboratory. Those are all things that can offer sort of expert advice. I would, I would say be careful about identifications that you and advice that you receive from press control or land care companies, which have an incentive to sell you certain products or services that are associated with that advice. Um, some other options that might help you figure that out, especially if you have those photos from your phone, bugguide.net is a great online resource for insect ID. Uh, there's, there's people that are on there all the time providing photo identification of insects. So, and also just posting a photo on, on a Facebook group or social media platforms can result in some helpful info. But again, I would, I would recommend using um, you know, somebody that you trust to identify that plant or insect or disease. So in my case, I was able to identify my sunflower moth through internet searches that matched the description of the damage as well as the image of the caterpillars that I'd found. Um, and so my choice ended up being if in years where I had tons and tons of sunflower moths all over my echinacea, I decided to pluck some of the flower heads off um, and, and bag them up and take them away. In other years, they really just didn't get out of hand. Um, and I was happy to leave my sunflower moths um, chewing away on my echinacea because they have as much right to it as the, the bees and butterflies that are on there earlier in the season. So that was the choice that I made. Uh, might not be the same one that you do, but that's, um, that just came from sort of figuring out what the pest was and what sort of the long-term consequences would be if I, uh, if I let it go. Most of the time that, that pest is, is coming in after my bees and butterflies have already taken advantage of the pollen and nectar on my echinacea. So I wasn't that worried about it. So coming back to um, what you do when you find an insect or a disease on the plant, um, the steps that you might go through in your head is just going back to make sure that the plant has what it needs, that it's in the right place. Um, maybe you have a, a more water loving plant that's in a drier garden and it might just need a little bit more water or maybe it needs um, a change in nutrients or soil pH. So the picture here of, of tomatoes, this is blossom end rot, which looks like a fungal disease, but once, you, once you've identified what it is, it's actually the result of calcium defici deficiency. Um, so knowing what you have uh, to manage can be helpful in figuring out how to address it. So in this case, you, know, you might just wanna add some nutrients to your soil to address the calcium deficiency. The other thing to think about when you are figuring out what kind of management you wanna do in the yard is just thinking about garden goals. What level of damage are you willing to live with? Um, are you trying to conserve insects and create wildlife habitat? Are you dependent on the fruits and vegetables that you're growing either to eat for your family or for profit? Figuring out sort of what level of intervention you're comfortable with, um, that can help you decide whether and how it makes sense to, to intervene. Thinking about my own yard, I came up with three main goals, which are conserving and supporting the diversity of insects and birds and other wildlife that are living, living around me with um, putting in native flowering plants. I wanted to create a beautiful space that I enjoy watching, you know, throughout the seasons and the mornings and the evenings, my coffee. 
and to manage land with as little effort as possible. One of my goals is lazy gardening. <laughs> so managing native perennial plants for wildlife and for my other goal of just being a lazy gardener. So keeping that conservation goal front and center, it's easier for me to accept some chaos in the garden, let go of cosmetic imperfections and nibbled leaves, um, because I know that as those flowering resources are providing um, a space for wildlife to thrive, and I can enjoy that uh, myself, both from you know, it not needing a lot of active management and from being able to observe and enjoy that wildlife in my yard. So based on all of those goals, I made the decision not to use pesticides, including organic pesticides in my own yards, because um, I want something that is healthy and functional that has minimal disturbance, minimal intervention. And sometimes that means accepting a certain level of damage. But um, it also means I can't grow everything that I want to grow in my local conditions of my, my yard. And that's OK, too. But again, it comes back to your own garden goals and what you are trying to achieve. Sometimes I do still intervene with non-chemical methods when something seems out of balance or it's threatening the survival of a plant. Um, so in, in crops and agricultural spaces, uh, extension and researchers can provide these kind of thresholds based on economics. So when does it make sense to intervene to prevent loss of yield, loss of crop yield, loss of profit? In home gardens, those economic thresholds generally don't work as well. We can tolerate more damage because it's not like our livelihoods or our profit margins are on the line. Um, and just because a pest is present doesn't mean it's a problem. So it might be present at a level that can still be kept in check by the other beneficial insects in our yards. So in the example of my echinacea, the presence of caterpillars isn't itself a threshold for action. I kind of like the, that caterpillars are using my garden resources because those caterpillars are food for birds. Um, so sometimes the caterpillar infestations aren't kept in check and the outbreak feels like a real imbalance in the system. And that's when I, I might go in and pluck some of those flower heads and try and keep the levels down for the next year. But um, again, I'm, I'm relatively lazy as a gardener. So it really takes a strong outbreak for me to decide to act um, on, on these pests in the garden. Um, in terms of my garden plants, so my sort of crop plants, this was a, a photo of some of the leaf miners that I had in my spinach. So there are similar sort of non-chemical methods you can use to intervene when you have these types of garden pests. So in this case, I just was plucking out some of these leaves of, of spinach that had spinach leaf miners in them and allowing new healthy leaves to grow out uh, following them. And that was enough to keep that pest population in check. Sanitation, so that would be an example of sanitation. Um, you can also hand pick insects off of plants or use water to knock them off of, of plants that they might be feeding of, feeding. Um, hand picking and squishing or knocking down with water can be a good first step for a lot of garden pests. Um, it can be a little bit tedious, but it also saves other wildlife in the garden from harm. So again, pesticides, um, most gardens can be managed well without pesticides. And we really would prefer to see them used only when a pest is threatening the survival of a plant uh, and not how it looks. So we wanna consider, you know, please, seeking out, please seek out information on pesticide products that you might be using both to people and to pollinators. Uh, keep in mind that there's a lot of deceptive marketing in this pesticide and pest control world on toxicity and that just because something's organic or derived from natural sources um, doesn't mean it's not toxic. So we have lots of resources available on this to help you gauge the toxicity of different pesticides to pollinators and we can help answer your questions if they come up around different pesticides and, and how toxic they might be. So you can find 
all of those sort of pesticide publications in our Xerces.org database. You can also come, come to us with questions that you have. So just to bring this full circle, I'm getting close to the end here. Um, building a resilient and healthy ecosystem in your yard or garden that attracts and supports wildlife, that attracts and supports pollinators. It's all about careful observation. That's both for pollinators and for other insects that may or may not be pests. What we really want everyone to be doing is getting observant, watching plants and wildlife. And this is gonna help you improve over time how your yard is functioning as a resource for pollinators. What's blooming when? Who's visiting it? Uh, what, con what conditions uh, are those plants and those pollinators responding to? And thinking about what's in your neighbor's yard and what's working well in their yard too. Um, what grows well and buzzes with life down the road from you is probably going to do well in your yard also. Um, and it's a better indication of how well it's going to do in your yard than how good it looked when you went to the nursery that day. So this is a case where we're absolutely encouraging you to be a nosy neighbor. Um, and I have, I've definitely made friends just by asking about plants that are, that are in somebody else's yard and figuring out where they got them and, and what it is. So um, definitely encourage you to get observant and incorporate the things that you learn into improving um, how your space is functioning. Watching your plants and what visits them is this, this sort of continuous process of evaluating what's working and what isn't working. Sometimes plants that you put in just don't do well and you have to take them out and replace them with something else. That's okay. You can improve over time. Um, this is how I become a lazy gardener. Sometimes, you know, even with the best water, nutrients, airflow, certain things aren't gonna do well in that space. And that's, that's okay. There are other things that will do well there. So in my Connecticut front yard, it just, it started with a few pollinator plants and a lot of mowed grass. And then over time, every year, I took up more and more space with pollinator plants. This is a colleague's yard in California, so it looks quite a bit different, but same idea. Um, I can't help but think, you know, as you do that process of observing, replacing, monitoring, your yards will be in, in better shape every single year. And that means that you are supporting these ecosystems over time. You know, we have these, just to take it all the way back to the beginning, invertebrates are playing this key role in our ecosystems. They're the base of food chains. Um, a pair of chickadees gathers there's an, an estimate from Doug Tallamy's work at, at, at Delaware that a pair of chickadees has to gather about 10,000 caterpillars to successfully raise their chicks, which is a lot of caterpillars. The more that we can do to support the base of the food chain, the more that we're doing to support wildlife throughout our ecosystems and, and other, um, yeah, other wildlife. So um, Lots of things that, are, that you're doing are making an important impact on the lives of birds and fish and amphibians and other creatures um, in our landscapes. All right, this is, this is really what I wanted to end on, which is just, I know that the presentation has kind of ranged over a variety of topics from general pollinator conservation to some doom and gloom on, on risks of pesticides. But I just wanted to end with a quick meditation on how the pesticide program at Xerces um, thinks about change and our philosophy of change. Our vision is a future where all landscapes, both towns and cities, farms and natural areas, can enjoy thriving and diverse invertebrate, uh, invertebrate populations, which means solutions at all scales. So voluntary changing changes on the parts of gardeners and farmers and other land managers, as well as some regulatory solutions that lead to broader changes. Um, and we've talked a little bit about those voluntary changes at home. This work is guided by science and also the precautionary principle. So taking preventive action in the face of uncertainty, shifting the burden of proof to the proponents of an activity. So in the, in the case of pesticides, uh, pesticide manufacturers taking the burden of proof to say this is safe as opposed to um, shifting the burden of proof onto us proving that it's not safe. 
and then exploring a wide range of alternatives to the things that might or that, that may be harmful. So the pesticides are a challenging arena to work in. There's lots of strong feelings on all sides. And in our work, what we're really trying to do is meet people where they are and then encourage them to move outside of their comfort zone to achieve conservation goals. Managing gardens and yards without pesticides can feel like a big ask, but the long-term payoff can be great in terms of ecological and human health. So we will keep asking. <laughs> Um, most of our work is through outreach like this webinar um, and the, the, the thing that builds often the last, the most lasting, the deepest change is working together and building relationships. So we hope that you'll take that to heart as you work in your own communities to conserve pollinators um, and to spread the word. So hope that you've learned something from this presentation. If you're interested in digging in on more um, on any of the subjects that I've talked about today, we have so many resources, as I said before, at our website, zarcis.org. Um, and if you go on there and you feel like you've looked through everything and you, you think there's a subject that needs more attention or that you can't find info about, please do let us know. We are often writing these types of guides in response to questions and concerns that come to us from farmers and from gardeners. And um, we really wanna meet the needs of um, the people that we're working with. So. Hopefully you can find something, but if not, please let us know. All right, with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you, Emily. That was terrific. Um, I think we'll start with, there's a whole bunch of questions in the chat. And I, so let me get back to the top of the chat and start there. So Joanna Giddings is interested in guidance on dealing with neighbors who spray, do spray for mosquitoes and ticks and the companies they hire. What's the best way to have that conversation and you know, be constructive? Because um, obviously one wants to be maintain good relations with your neighbors while at the same time, maybe encouraging better practices or making sure that they're not endangering you and your, you know, your family. Yeah, that's a really good question and a tough one um, because everybody, everybody sprays for different reasons, right? Um, and this was something that I actually dealt with with my parents um, who have had, you know, lawn care companies, mosquito and tick companies come to their front door, knock on the door and say, hey, we want to spray your backyard. And it turns out, you know, some of their neighbors got the same knock on their door and said yes. Um, so one, one of the things that um, was helpful for them was um, to sort of talk to their neighbors in from a place of shared values um, to say, you know, hey, I had this guy knock on my door and I asked my, my daughter, who's an entomologist about it. Turns out they were telling us things that weren't true about the chemicals that were, were going onto our yards. And um, here's some stuff that I found out from her about the toxicity to kids and, um, and pets. So, you know, I think it was, what they were trying to to go on was mostly, you know, um, sort of the the shared shock at being deceived about the the, the toxicity of the things that those companies were spraying. Um, that's not always going to work because sometimes people are um, are accepting of that level of toxicity in order to get the benefit of not having mosquitoes and ticks in their backyard. Um, one of the things that I might recommend looking at is just saying we have, you know, we have these um, community mosquito management guidelines um, and the backyard tick and mosquito sprays are not something that are um, a particularly long term solution. They do have impacts, you know, they, the, depending on what's being sprayed, um, if it's a pyrethroid, they do have impacts on um, potential impacts on um, human health and pet health and kid health. Um, and they're not, you know, they don't last forever and they don't work that well. So if it's just one backyard that's being sprayed, but you're not dealing with the source habitat around um, where, you know, mosquitoes are breeding, um, it's not going to be that effective. So you've not only have you put this, you know, quote unquote, barrier spray in your backyard 
that your your kids and your pets are playing in. Um, but mosquitoes and ticks are probably going to wander their way into your yard from elsewhere. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think I think it's going to be really challenging to have those those conversations because um, obviously mosquitoes and ticks can provide you know they they have human health impacts themselves when they carry disease. Um, but if you can if you can talk to your neighbors about some of the concerns that that might you might have about the impacts of those sprays, and also try and say hey maybe we should work with our town or our community on these community-based solutions that are going to be longer term where we're you know really addressing source habitat and making sure that the the larger municipality is dealing with mos mosquitoes and ticks that's going to have a, a longer and more measurable impact on mosquito and tick populations than you putting this one spray in your yard <laughs> um, that probably is going to have impacts you know on on your pollinators on your kids and pets, um, and it's going to be sort of a, a shorter term solution anyway. Um, I don't know if that really answered your question, but mosquito and tick management is a really, it's a really hard one um, because people have very good reasons for wanting to protect um, themselves and their kids from, from getting those, you know, vector diseases. But the longer term solution is really working at a larger scale on ecological solutions for mosquito and tick management. So Emily, I have a kind of a, a follow-up to that question that you you know, inspired by what you said, which is, do you ever talk to like the um, public health, local public health officials? Because I mean, I think sometimes people feel they're getting conflicting advice from different sources because of mm -hmm. course, public health officials have human health front and center. But um, I know we are fortunate in our case that I think our uh, local ledge light uh, health district official is also herself an avid gardener. So I think she's trying to learn and, and try to find that the happy, happy place to be in how to balance the harm um, harms that these different or the risks of these different approaches. Um, do you, yeah. have you found that to be helpful or fruitful? Yes, absolutely. I would say um, talking to public health officials, especially, I mean, I, you can often find traction in just trying to work with that individual to find the thing, the solutions that really are going to work at a municipal level. Um, and we have, you know, there's, there are examples of how this has worked in other towns and cities and other public health districts of, um, of really taking a, uh, an ecological based approach to mosquito management that's focused on source reduction um, and reducing breeding habitat. And then um, that that, you know, then carries out into lower levels of, of mosquitoes found in people's backyards in that community. So that can be a really good conversation to have. Um, sometimes you're not going to get traction with the public health person that you talk to because they really are just focused on, you know, we want to make sure that we're taking care of this from a human health perspective and not allowing Triple E or West Nile or whatever to, um, to get out into the community. Um, so we're going to take whatever steps necessary to keep our mosquito populations under check. Um, but it's still a good conversation to have and there may be some, some traction that you can find there um, for, for implementing some more ecological preventive practices as part of that public health districts management. Okay, there's lots of questions so I should probably uh, move on. The next question from Sue Stark is, uh, a concern about creating a habitat garden in lead contaminated soil. And um, at what threshold does lead harm pollinators? So I think you'd have to see pretty heavy lead contamination before you would see impacts on pollinators. There haven't been that many studies on heavy metal contamination. It's mostly of some um, work done from mine tailings actually on uh, heavy metal contamination. Um, but a lot of yeah, I think if you're seeing really heavy lead contamination, you might want to consider um, some plants that are particularly good at uptaking heavy metals. And there are, I think you can probably Google that. There are some plants that are better at taking up those heavy metals. And then you can, 
you know, take those, remove those over time to um, get the lead out. But in general, we haven't seen big impacts of, of heavy metal contamination at the sort of low levels that you might find um, on pollinators. So I wouldn't be too worried about it. Okay, um, can you put a number to that? I, I think seem to recall, I think Sue does has had her soil tested, so she knows the level. So are we talking about like the human threshold? I think it's 450 parts per million or something like that. Maybe that's... I might have to go dig into that. I don't have a number off the top of my head. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right. Um, our nurseries, so is there any requirement currently for nurseries to label or inform consumers whether their plant or seed has been um, insecticide treat, treated or with what? There is not any requirement for that. Um, there, there are nurseries that will voluntarily label. So typically they would label that they are not treating with certain types of insecticides. So you will see some nurseries label that they have not treated with neonicotinoids because of the consumer demand around that um, class of insecticides. But that doesn't mean that those plants haven't been treated with a different insecticide. Um, so if you see neonic free, it doesn't mean it's pesticide free. Um, so there is no requirement and there's no sort of universal labeling scheme for, for insecticide treatments. So that's why it can be really helpful for you to start that conversation with your nurseries and try and figure out what their pest management programs look like. Okay, and the next question actually is about neonics and you talked about woody plants and the persistence. What about herbaceous plants? If you bought, you know, a perennial and it was treated before you bought it, by the second year after it's died back and regrown, is it still potentially, has how hazardous? Is there any data to say how hazardous it still is? So, partners? yeah, that's a great question. Um, Typically the plant itself, if it's just, if it's a forb that was treated with insecticides, you won't see that have um, systemic pesticides in the second year, but that is dependent on um, what's happening in the soil. So it can, these, these systemics can be quite persistent in the soil. So if you're purchasing a plant that was treated with pesticides, um, you're gonna wanna do your best to replace the soil that it came in if that makes sense. So that the next year, it's not gonna take up anything that's bound in that soil. Um, but the plant itself, if it's herbaceous, um, shouldn't have the, the same level of pesticides. Those, those should be um, relatively, relatively clean the next year if it's not in the soil. Great, that's good to know. Okay. Does pepper spray used to do squirrel, used to, excuse me, deter squirrels affect pollinators? So I don't think that it has um, a lot of sort of direct toxicity. It can be repellent. So a lot of the, the essential oil type products and um, capsaicin and some of those other um, sort of natural deterrents, those are also kind of repellent to pollinators. Uh, they often don't have a lot of, um, sort of toxicity, they're not creating lethal impacts on them. They just um, so keep them away in the same way that they might deter squirrels as well. Okay, um, Claire asks, a number of years ago, we discovered that wood used by a former owner as a bed border was treated with arsenic. So I guess like the first generation of pressure treated woods. We remove the wood, but should we remove all pollinator plants from the area where this wood was in place for many years? So I don't have much familiarity with arsenic, um, but I doubt that you're going to see an issue with the pollinator plants um, where you've had this treated wood. Most likely it was bound up um, with the treatment in that wood. I doubt that you're gonna have that coming into pollinator plants in, in really high levels from your Does soil plant. test um, be able to, do they test for arsenic, do you know? I imagine that they would, <laughs> yeah. I think that, you can-, you like can a, An alternative just to create peace of mind. Yep. And you can ask when you're, you know, looking at different options for soil testing, what the panel is. Um, that you'll be getting back. 
Yeah, I think two, two links have been put up on the chat, both for the UMass Amherst um, site you talked about, Emily, and also for UConn's soil testing site. Okay, uh, next question also about uh, preservatives is, what about wood preservatives like creosote? Are they simply repellents or do they have any toxicity? So, uh is that a question from you, Lydia? Yeah, I, got <laughs> I have some old um, creosote treated wood used as um, a kind of ornamentally as part of my hardscape. Okay, I, I'm not positive. I'd have to go looking into that. Um, and that's actually a great, a great question for me to go diving into. Um, I know cedar, cedar treated wood, you know, cedar wood, which is um, naturally repellent is also repellent to pollinators. So if you're using a cedar mulch, that can be um, something that is that ends up being repellent to bees that are, you know, potentially wanting to nest in and around your garden. Something to be aware of. Uh, but I'd have to I have to go looking for creosote and other preservatives. Okay. <clears throat> And then I had another question, <laughs> this one's mine too, is so um, how effective are, are the native predators at controlling some of the non-native insect pests like oleander aphids or Japanese beetles? Do you know? Uh, yeah, it, <laughs> um, oleander aphids can be controlled by some natural predators, but it depends on how present they are in your garden. Japanese beetles I have not found to be well controlled by natural predators. So actually for both of these, um, hand picking might be a good option if you're finding them in your plants. So like oleander aphids, if they're on your milkweeds, um, one, one thing you can do is get a soft glove um, and just yeah, pull on I'd the plants. <laughs> yeah, do, doing some nasty squishing of oleander aphids is probably your best bet for keeping those populations low. Japanese beetles, um, yeah, natural predators just don't don't really keep those in line from what I've found. And you can you can use a Japanese beetle trap, like one of those pheromone traps, but I actually find that that just is attracting Japanese beetles in from all different parts of your landscape and may or may not actually be just catching and um, catching and killing the ones that are in your garden. You might just be bringing in more beetles to your garden from, from your neighbor's yard. Um, so hand picking is what I've used for, for Japanese beetles as well. Great, thanks. Okay, next question is, what is a good natural fertilizer for the garden? Um, and this person, Ali, has read that raw fish, which we know has had traditionally been used, buried in the garden works well. Although I imagine it might have some other liabilities. <laughs> Anyhow, can yeah. you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I for what I use in my garden is compost, um, and the, it's going to depend on sort of what your what your garden needs are. So it you know depending on your soil pH, depending on the fertility that's already there, um, you're going to be wanting to kind of balance that out um, with the fertilizers that you're putting in. So in some cases, it might be wood ash or lime to to, um, to help get your soil to a good pH. Um, for the, for the sort of nitrogen phosphorus side of things, um, you know, I'm using compost that's built out of, you know, yard waste and food waste from, from my house. And that seems to work quite well for building organic matter and providing fertility. Okay, and actually in the chat, I think one of our members did suggest earlier that I think the Yukon testing site, they now, I don't know if you have to ask them, but, um, in addition to giving back your soil analysis when the recommended um, sort of improvements, they will do an organics only sort of um, set of uh, recommendations. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see Michelle's observation about Japanese beetle and oleander mm -hmm. aphids appearing in cycles. Totally agree. That's true for a lot of, a lot of our garden pests. They'll come in cycles. Um, and yeah, the aphids I have, I have had good success with a soft glove and then Japanese beetles. And I also had an outbreak of earwigs um, on my milkweed that I also, I knocked some of those into soapy water. I didn't knock all of them in, but some of them, because uh -huh. it seemed like they were attacking beneficials that were coming 
to the flowers. They were all buried into the flower heads of the milkweeds. Okay. Um, and then the final question, uh, what kind of chemicals will make an organic pesticide or fertilizer label in industry? In other words, I guess, what is the basic criteria for organic as opposed to what's defined as synthetic? So you gave the pyrethrin, pyrethroid uh, comparison. Yeah, so the, um, so organic materials are those that are derived from natural materials. So um, your, your fertilizers would be your sort of mineral fertilizers like copper, sulfur, zinc would be things like, those would be considered um, organic. All of that's regulated by the Organic Materials Review Institute that has a list of things that they consider to be organic or natural. Um, as opposed to things that are developed in a lab and synthesized. Um, so that's the difference between the pyrethrin, which is sort of crushed out of a, of a chrysanthemum flower, as opposed to pyrethroids, which are synthetically produced in a laboratory. Um, but so Omri, Omri is the arbiter of what's considered organic. And they, that's, that's what would determine whether or not a product receives an organic label. Right, so that's that's the little logo or label that you would see on a product if it is certified by um, that organic um, certification body. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, but your point, Emily, was a great one about organic, even though it's naturally derived, sometimes the product we use is either much more concentrated than the natural um, you know, occurrence. And therefore you can, as some of us who have worked in the pharmaceutical industry know, toxicity is all about the dose. Absolutely. Rather than necessarily the molecule itself. So <laughs> that's a component of it. Okay. And there one more question. Actually, and I have um, a question from the email. Let me um, give you that question before I forget it. And that was on, is there a, a way you would rec recommend to protect um, wooden structures? So like siding or shingles on your house from carpenter bees. Can you discourage them without killing them? <laughs> That is a, that's a tough question. Um, so I had carpenter bees in my shed, excuse me. Um, so one of the things that deters carpenter bees is good thick coat of paint. Um, so if you, if you have a garden shed that you're concerned about carpenter bees getting into, um, giving it a good, you know, primer and coats of exterior paint, getting all of your sort of um, nooks and crannies filled in with caulk can help discourage them from creating a nest in it. Um, if they're already present in the wood, that's a little bit more challenging. And um, one thing, you know, if you really are wanting to get them out um, of, of whatever exterior wood you have, when, so they'll overwinter in the tunnels that are created in that wood. When they start to emerge in the spring, once they've emerged out of those overwintering holes, um, you can go in and then quickly caulk them uh, and caulk the holes to try and keep them from using that same tunnel again the following year. Um, but other than that, I know it's, it's their preferences for sort of untreated wood that has some holes in it. Um, the alternative might be providing some untreated wood with holes in it somewhere else um, to try and attract them to using that as a as a nesting resource as opposed to your house or your garden shed. But paint and caulk are usually your best friends for trying to keep carpenter bees out. If you do try the trap method, Emily, is there a preferred wood type that might be a better trap? Like you mentioned that cedar has natural repellent, so that's probably not yep. a good choice. But pine, a softwood versus a hardwood or... Yeah, softwood is probably going to be your better bet for a trap. Um, and if you are putting a trap out, um, you're going to want it sort of at or above the level of your existing carpenter bee hole. Um, so that might that might, if they're up near your roof line, I guess. Might be a little bit hard. Yeah, think of it like a bat house. You got to get it up pretty high. Oh, wow. They like to come out, you know, come in right under the eaves where they're getting protected from some of the rain. Okay, uh, a final question from the chat. If you are putting non-organic kitchen waste into your compost, is there a problem with the pesticides in the compost? 
Um, oh, okay. I, I understand now. If you buy nor non-organic vegetables and fruits, in other words. Right. I think, I think most likely the residues there are going to be pretty low. Um, you know, I would still encourage you to, you know, if you're putting things like orange peels and banana peels into your compost, you know, make sure you've given those a wash before, um, you know, you can give, give your oranges and your bananas a wash before you peel them and put them in the compost. But generally speaking, the residues will be pretty small in, in your food um, coming in from, you know, that's one of the reasons, you know, that, that, our, that we have pesticide regulation is to make sure that in particular human diets have low residues coming into them. So once they've gone through your composting process, they, they should be okay. Uh, one thing to be aware of with composting is if you're getting um, manure in particular from, um, you know, a local dairy um, or a local horse farm, that sometimes that can be contaminated with herbicides, um, persistent herbicides, depending on what they're using um, on their property, can also have antibiotics and other things in it. So that's something to just chat about if you're, if you're bringing in organic materials from, um, you know, a local farmer, just chat about what might be in there uh, before you use it in your own garden. What good advice. And then what a great way to start the conversation too with people who may not be aware. Yeah, yeah, but thanks. These are great questions. Um, a lot of times this is where I get, you know, the next thing that I really need to look at, which in this case is wood preservatives. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, are there any other questions from the floor? You, you don't have to type them into chat now if you just want to raise your hand or, you know, uh, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself to speak if you have another question for Emily. Well, um, thanks everyone for being here on a beautiful day. We're yeah. talking about pollinators. Well, what I'm going to do is actually pause or stop the recording now. Um, I do have a few announcements for kind of uh, short term consumption for of things that might be interesting to people. So if anybody is willing to hang around a bit, um, I'm going to, as I say, stop the recording.